Good morning and welcome to Education, Health, and Environmental Affairs Committee. Uh, welcome committee members, welcome people testifying, and welcome those of you following on YouTube. Uh, we have a number of bills. We'll try to get through as many as possible before our uh, midday break, and then we'll resume at 1.30. Um, uh, the order of bills, there have been a few small changes. Uh, Senator Peters will go first. That's Senate Bill 40. We have we are shifting Senator Hester 231 to second, and then Senator Washington 155, then Senator Peters. Um, we're going to ask you to cut return, Senator Peters. I, I apologize for splitting up your testimony. Um, we have that unfortunately throughout the day. I see you have three bills today. So we, we will get back to you on the third bill. Hopefully we'll get through the first two bills uh, between 11 and 1230. Um, as people know, uh, the, the first witness after the sponsor can speak up to five minutes. They do not have to take all five minutes. Uh, subsequent uh, witnesses will speak up to two and a half minutes. Uh, because of the number of bills, we may have to cut folks off. Uh, and if I do ask, please wrap up your um, comments. Uh, with that, um, we'll start with Senator Peters, Senate Bill 40. Uh, welcome to the committee, Senator Peters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this will be brief. I have no witnesses. A couple of years ago, um, thanks to you and members of the uh, General Assembly, we created the uh, Richard W. Collins III Leadership Scholarship, which uh, gave a full tuition to uh, young men and women that wanted to pursue uh, uh, ROTC at our HBCUs. So we set aside a million dollars and I went to the first graduation and I can tell you the Collins family was ecstatic and uh, she has really healed because of this scholarship. Um, what the issue here today is, is that when we put the bill together, because uh, First Lieutenant Richard Collins uh, came from Bowie State University, we felt that we should have at least 25% of the money allocated to Bowie State first, and then the rest go to the other HBCUs. So what happened was that the entire million dollars wasn't spent because Bowie State has an ROTC program, Morgan has an ROTC program, Coppin's program falls underneath Morgan. So Morgan handles all the administration of Coppin's program and Coppin uh, through Senator Hayes has told me that they're at some point gonna create their own ROTC program. And then U UMES doesn't have an ROTC program in place right now. So in essence, a quarter of the money, 250,000 was spent on Bowie State. An another uh, couple hundred thousand was spent for Morgan and we left 250,000 on the table, even though Bowie had even more grad, more, more young men and women that wanted to be, you know, uh, in the ROTC. So they didn't get scholarships. So all this does, it changes the bill from having a ceiling of 25% to a floor of 25% for Bowie so that the young men and women there, we can allocate the scholarships, we can go out to Morgan, we can uh, give some to Coppin, fall into that program, and then we can circle back and give the money to all the rest of the candidates so we can fully expend the million dollars. That's what this bill does. Well, first of all, thank you, Senator Peters, for uh, introducing the bill last year and for uh, tightening it up, uh, a lot of times legislation calls for tweaking uh, after we try implementing it. Um, it's fairly straightforward. I don't see any questions. There is no opposition, no other witnesses. So that concludes the hearing on SB 40. Senator Peters, we'll alert you. It shouldn't be too long before we get to your second bill of the morning, okay? No, no problem. I appreciate it, Mr. Chairman. No worries. No, our, our, our pleasure. Um, we're going to move Senator Hester. 231, do I have the correct one, Senator Hester? That is the correct one. Thank you so much. Um, okay, um, uh, Senator Hester will be followed uh, by Laurie Ressler, uh, Bobby Zirkin, and uh, uh, Anupam Joshi. Uh, and I believe, 
the only unfavorable is written. So, um, uh, oh no, I'm sorry. And also Ms. Derrett from uh, Baltimore City. So with that, uh, Senator Hester, uh, please begin. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Pinsky, Vice Chair Kagan, members of the Education, Health and Environmental Affairs Committee. Um, long commute for me this morning. Uh, thank you for your consideration of Senate Bill 231. This simple bill directs the State Department of Education, the Maryland Department of Health, and the Behavioral Health Administration to consult with professionals who specialize in child development and child psychology to develop a cyber safety guide and training course as a resource for students, parents, and teachers grappling with the emergence of ubiquitous social media and technology in our daily lives. This guide will be developed in consultation with experts in child development and child psychology, and will include information and best practices promoting responsible internet use through the prevention and management of cyberbullying, content, content depicting or encouraging self-harm, hate speech, graphic content, identity theft and cybersecurity threats, dissemination of false information, negative and negative impacts of social media and technology usage on mental, behavioral, and physical health. The handbook will then be posted on the websites of the Department of Education, the Department of Health, um, and distributed to each county board of education for their own use. Now, over the past year, more of our lives it has been online than ever. And we've all, while we've all taken the necessary steps to slow, slow the spread of COVID, we've really depended on this technology for work, school, um, and to connect with each other. And I, I as a mom of two daughters, um, have watched them as they spend more and more time on, on screens because it's necessary. I also chair the, the Joint Committee on Cyber, IT, and Biotechnology. And over the interim in 2019, prior to the pandemic, we had the pleasure of being joined by Dr. Jacob Schwartz, a child and adolescent psychiatrist psychiatry fellow at Georgetown University, and Dr. Stephen Zinn from the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Their research had been focused specifically on the issue of teen tech and social media use. And during their testimony, they noted that among teens, technology had been in constant presence. This isn't gonna surprise anybody. 95% of teenagers in 2018 had have access to a smartphone and 45% were online most of the time and 90% used a social media platform. While the data for the past year is not currently available, I can only imagine that it's going up. However, simultaneously with this growing prominence of this technology over the last five to eight years, suicide rates across 10 to 14 year olds and 14 to 18 year olds and 18 to 20 year old youth has also increased at least 50%. And since 2010, the suicide rate has doubled for teen boys and tripled for teen girls. Now, obviously the correlation between these trends and the statistical points is not enough to warrant an assumption of causation. Suicide rates and mental health and behavioral disorders are very complex and subject to a multitude of factors. But research, research has shown that there are complex links between mental health and social media usage. Um, luckily, emerging research is beginning to point to steps we as a community can take to encourage healthy cyber practices for our kids. Simple steps like minimizing screen time, which was easier prior to COVID, participating in healthy patterns of co-use on the part of the parent and modeling that healthy screen use can make all the difference. But they do require the knowledge and best practices and a concerted effort on all of our parts to come together and address this as a public health issue. Now, over the past year, many jurisdictions have done really excellent work to promote healthy online practices for students. It is my intent that this handbook would draw upon emerging expertise in the fields of psychology and development, as well as the experiences of our local school systems to create a resource for parents, children, and teachers to draw on what is attempting to address concerns of safe technology use in their daily lives. You will see in the fiscal note of the legislation that while MSDE estimates the general fund expenditures may increase up to 1.4 million if contractual services are necessary, the Department of Legislative Services notes that free modules and services are currently, are currently available that do meet the requirements of the bill at a reduced cost. DLS also notes that development and distribution of the Cyber Safety Guidebook can be uh, achieved with existing resources. I believe this work is important to our constituents. It will be great use to parents um, like, all, like many of you um, and also to teachers and students and helping them to balance the demands of an increasingly digital world with their own mental and behavioral well-being. Um, 
For that reason, I respectively request a favorable report on SB 231. Uh, thank you, Senator Fry Hester. Uh, let's move to Lori uh, Ressler as a uh, uh, first witness. Good morning, Chair Pinsky, members of the committee. Thank you for allowing me to speak with you today regarding Senate Bill 231 and the development of the Cyber Safety Guide and Training Course for our public schools. My name is Laurie Ressler, and I am the Technical Assistant for Media Technical Services in the Office of Instructional Technology and Library Media for the Howard County Public School System. I am a state certified media specialist for grades K through 12, and I have taught library media and technology in Howard County Elementary Schools since 2011. I'm speaking today as a professional educator and a private citizen, and my opinions do not reflect those of the Howard County Public School System. I've personally witnessed the explosive growth in the technology, but use of technology by our students at an increasingly younger age over the past 10 years. This growth has only been accelerated by the pandemic and virtual learning. But instruction in cyber safety and digital citizenship isn't something we just started doing since COVID became our new normal. I'm extremely proud of the instruction I've helped create and implement on these subjects over the past decade. Our Office of Instructional Technology and Library Media has developed curricula with a solid grounding in best practices and current pedagogy for our K through five students in weekly technology and media classes and for our secondary students through the health and library media programs. This, this instruction continues, and I might add robustly, in a virtual environment. Our lessons meet not only Maryland digital learning standards, but also the standards of the International Tech Society for Technology and Education and the American Association of School Librarians. Throughout the pandemic, my office has provided weekly virtual professional development. So every Howard County technology teacher and media specialist is ready to help each student to become a safe, thoughtful and productive digital citizen. Every child in Maryland deserves such a well-planned and implemented learning experience. We all want to ensure the safety and the emotional and mental well-being of our students when we're using digital tools. But beyond that, we want our students to become more than just passive consumers of technology. We want them to strive to be critical thinkers and ethical creators and collaborators in our digital world. Everything we do drives toward that goal. To this, the creation at the state level of a cyber safety training guide and training program, drawing on the research of child psychology and technology experts, and made available to all public school jurisdictions, would be a valuable supplement for us as educators to draw upon as we continue to refine and improve our cyber safety and digital citizenship programs. I respectfully ask that you support me and my fellow technology and media teachers across Maryland by supporting the passage of Senate Bill 231. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Ms. Ressler. Um, uh, uh, Senator uh, Bobby Zarkin, please unmute him. And well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see all of you guys. This is, uh, this is a little different. <laughs> um, so I, I wanted to, uh, this is my first time being on this side of things, but I uh, wanted, first of all, to thank uh, Senator Hester for for inviting me to come and speak on this. Um, I'm working with, I'm doing this on behalf of uh, Bradley and Nikki Bozeman Foundation. Um, Bradley Bozeman, Brad Bozeman, for those of you who are Baltimore Ravens fans, are, is the starting left guard for the Ravens. And he and his wife um, have a foundation that they've been working on across the country uh, on anti-bullying efforts. And um, he actually is the, uh, I had an opportunity to go on Zoom last night with Katie, or with Senator Hester and, uh, and the Bozemans, he's uh, the Baltimore Ravens uh, nominee for uh, Walter Payton Man of the Year based on all their efforts, really just amazing people. They wanted me to uh, um, come and testify on this bill and it's obviously something that's important to me. Um, it's a, the issue of cyber bullying, I mean, this bill goes way beyond that, but um, the bill, having these kids and their parents and faculty understand the dangers that are out there, not just about cyber bullying, but about cyber stalking, revenge porn and sextortion, a lot of the things that we've done in the Maryland General Assembly that you all have done in making good reactive laws. Unfortunately, the kids just don't know about it. They don't know what to do um, when they're cyber bullied or when they're cyber stalked. Um, and these technologies, I, like Katie, I have two young daughters, as you all know, and, and um, the, the things that they're facing online are just extraordinary right now. Um, and I wanted to give you just a couple of quick examples. Um, 
just from, from my own law practice, I've had people call in. One of them, obviously, is not from my law practice, but you remember the story of Grace McComas and uh, the torture she went through before she ended up taking her own life. Um, we do have laws and that were ways to protect them. For instance, we all created a peace order so that the kids can actually go and get judges to stop that, but they don't know it. The parents don't know it. So they'll call people like me in my law office and, and you know, ask what to do. Uh, another one is this crazy story came into my office about, I guess it's called a ghosting software. Some girl, a little 14 year old, beautiful girl got texted to her phone, what she thought was a text from her parents, from her mother, but it actually wasn't her mother. It was some perv old coach of hers that had continued to follow her. And the, the text coming to her phone was from her mom or you know, from her mom's phone. It said you know, something to the effect of, you know, enjoy the party tonight, you know, make sure and bring your condoms. And so she called her mother and said, why would you send that to me? And the mother said, what are you talking about? I didn't send you anything. It was this guy using software to tell the girl, pretending that it was the mother. I mean, God forbid that had said, come meet me somewhere. This girl could have gotten raped. And then there was a last one just a month ago, somebody on a Zoom like this with a bunch of kids. Um, and they had, one of the boys this is a private school. One of the boys had Photoshopped this girl with a naked body underneath of it. And, and on the Zoom said, we're gonna send this out on Snapchat and TikTok or whatever else. If you don't take your clothes off in front of everybody right now, this is a 12 year old girl. Thank God she didn't do it. And you know, the kids got in trouble at their private school, but these are the things these kids are facing right now. Um, it's, it's extraordinary that, um, make last point, just my kids' school, they had some national expert come and do something for the PTA about who's monitoring these things, the number of, you know, just on TikTok, the number of sex offenders and would-be sex offenders that are monitoring um, some of these apps, like looking for little girls who are posting these, you know, what they think are innocent videos, but these guys like stalking them online and trying to bait them. Um, it's just extraordinary stuff that, you know, you and I didn't have to deal with growing up, but thankfully, um, and it's something that the parents should really be much more aware of the kids should be aware of that the things that they're doing have real consequences um and there are real dangers that are lurk lurking out there so i apologize for going on too long i just wanted to say thank you it's so good to see all of you guys um and you know stay safe and uh appreciate the opportunity to come here and be with you thank you so much senator zirkin Um, so, Chair Pinsky, I think you're muted. I apologize. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Zirkin. If you can hang around, there may be a few questions. Um, let's go to the final speaker, uh, Anupam Joshi. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee. It's my a uh, distinct honor and pleasure today to offer some insights into Senate Bill 231 regarding cyber safety for school children. Um, my name is Anupam Joshi. I am the Oros Family Professor and Chair of Computer Science and Electrical Engineering at UMBC. I'm also the Director of the Center for Cybersecurity. Uh, that said, my, the comments I express today are my own personal views and not necessarily that of uh, UMBC. Um, I rise today, Mr. Chairman, to testify strongly in support of uh, Senate Bill 231, uh, which requires the creation of a guide and training courses around cyber safety. Uh, my opinion is informed not just by my expertise in cybersecurity and social media analytics, but more importantly, as a parent. Um, it's fairly uncontroversial, uh, Mr. Chairman, to say that students need help navigating cyber safe in a, uh, cyberspace in a safe manner, just like they do the physical world. In the physical world, however, we as a society and educators have millennia of experience. You know, school and parents teach their children to be wary of strangers, to wash their hands for 20 seconds with soap and water, to cover their sneezes, to behave well, 
in, in public gatherings and so on. These are all small everyday actions that increase the safety and keep children from harm in the physical world. Unfortunately, that's not the case in cyberspace. Cyberspace is not just new, but it's rapidly evolving. A social media platform or a particular way of handling phishing attacks that a parent or an educator may have learned uh, for their first child is already outdated or changed by the time their next child is in a given grade. Uh, for educators, the situation is even more complex. Technology is so uh, quickly changing every two or three years uh, that they need to keep up. So it's difficult for parents and educators to be aware of all the constantly evolving dangers in cyberspace. This limits their ability to teach children uh, in an age appropriate way. I guess the defensive driving equivalent um, of uh, cyberspace uh, behavior and online activities. So the state creating some education material and training courses that the parents and educators can use and that can be kept up to date is important and I think this bill uh, is a, an important step in that direction. Uh, many dangers of cyberspace are well known and extensively discussed such as cyberbullying or ransomware. Um, Senator Zirkin gave eloquent testimony about some of these issues so I won't belabor that uh, discussion. However, there are other dangers that are relatively new and unique. Uh, first off, uh, cyberspace sort of creates this private space where the child interacts with the world and to all but the most technologically savvy parents, and even sometimes for them, limiting these interactions is very hard to virtually impossible. How do you limit something like ghosting, uh, which uh, Senator Zirkin um, alluded to? So there have been several recent cases, as the Senator said, where children have been lured into sharing suggestive pictures and then blackmailed into doing even worse. Another new. Um, We're going to have to wrap up. We're going to have to wrap up. Testing. Yes, sir. So, so as a final thing, Senator, um, curating information, sharing information is extremely important. So, I strongly support uh, this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there are no more oral witnesses uh, in support or against. Um, as I mentioned, there were one or two in opposition. Uh, but if there are any questions for any of the witnesses or the sponsor, uh, now is the time, Senator Kagan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just wanted to briefly welcome back former Senator Zirkin and uh, thank you for your ongoing commitment to cyberbullying. You've been a champion in this for a long time. And uh, thank you, Senator Hester, for picking up the mantle. I just wanted to take this opportunity to brag about Gaithersburg resident Kavanaugh Bell who started Cool Dope Living, Cool and Dope Living, uh, after he was bullied and dropped out of school because it was such an enormous problem. He uh, was just featured at the inauguration, uh, the inaugural concert and got to introduce Justin Timberlake. So there is visibility and awareness about cyberbullying and bullying in general. And the question is what the right answers are, but I think we need all hands on deck for this. So, uh, so, isn't that so, Senator Zirkin? <laughs> I saw him on television and, and, and immediately, I remember you introduced us to him on the floor and I, I texted Senator Kagan immediately. I was really, he got older too. <laughs> he, he did, he's now eight rather than seven or six. Anyway, I know. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Zirkin is able to wear a, a sweater or a sweatshirt at home <laughs> uh, rather than uh, dress up, so. Um, this is the nicest I've dressed all year. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, seeing no further questions, uh, that concludes the hearing on um, uh, 231. Thank you all for testifying. Good to see you again, Bobby. Uh, we're going to move on to the next bill, which is Senator Washington 155. Uh, she will be followed by Brian Watkins, uh, Dejane Day, uh, Ingrid Lofgren. Um, and I believe... Uh, there is only one unfavorable, which is written. Um, so with that, uh, Senator Washington, uh, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, good morning still, uh, Chair Pinsky, uh, Vice Chair Kagan, fellow colleagues. Uh, and uh, it was good to see our former chair, uh, both Senator uh, Hester and I spent a year in JPR. So it's good to 
good to see you again. Um, thank you all so much for your willingness to hear testimony regarding SB 155. And it's uh, very similar to the first bill in that we're trying, we need to make some really critical improvements to our Maryland college tuition waiver, waiver for youth that are experiencing homelessness. Uh, so in 19, uh, sorry, in 2014, Maryland led the nation in creating a tuition waiver program for unaccompanied homeless youth. And it was voted in by a unanimous bipartisan vote. And I'm really honored uh, that uh, to have sponsored that legislation to establish that tuition waiver. And also the cross file uh, was Senator Edward Riley. So I think it's again, pretty cool that you've come back to this committee uh, in an opportunity to, to look at this legislation. Uh, and all of us who supported that original bill really wanna make sure that it is effective. Uh, in the intervening years, we've seen the tuition waiver provide a real pathway for higher education, um, for youth to move out of homelessness, for so many bright students who otherwise could be locked into intergenerational poverty. And since then, we've learned from implementation challenges uh, in, in Maryland uh, that other states have created some similar homeless youth tuition exemptions. Uh, so now in 2021, we see that we're out of step. So we were the leaders seven years ago, um, but we're really out of step with other states um, uh, in providing homeless youth uh, tuition exemptions uh, for our failing students. So today our youth are facing a crisis that threatens to keep more students out of college. Um, ongoing COVID pandemic is acerbating inequitable access to higher education. Uh, we hear that every day, their hardships are falling disproportionately on low income white, rural and black and brown youth. Uh, it's urgent that we take action by learning from the challenges of our tuition waiver program. Um, SB 155 responds to it, these challenges uh, by bringing our law in line with the other successful states. So this is what the bill would change. Um, there's an attachment uh, to my written testimony that I've provided each of you uh, also with a chart. So digitally we've provided that, that outlines the problems with the current tuition waiver program. Uh, and the corresponding solutions that are addressed in SB 155. I'm just gonna briefly walk you through this chart. Uh, so please open, you know, maybe open it up or take a look at it. Um, uh, maybe in the future I'll do slides, uh, but uh, this amendments uh, are not made in response to oppositional concerns, but instead to reflect additional improvements. So you can see the first change is to repeal the requirement to verify each student's homeless status annually. The current requirement creates a catch-22 where students achieve stable housing, then thanks to, the, thanks to the tuition waiver and other financial aid. Then once they are stably housed, they lose access to the waiver and they lose other financial aid and they become homeless again. I can assure you that the original legislation did not intend for waiver recipients to remain homeless throughout college. Of course, this makes no sense. So we, we know that students need stable housing to be successful. Uh, it is telling us that, that no other state uh, with a homeless tuition waiver requires annual verification. And Congress just passed legislation eliminating annual verification of homelessness for independent student status on the FAFSA. So repealing Maryland's annual verification homeless requirement will protect students from the devastating consequences of losing this waiver and therefore their housing. The second change is to repeal of the eligibility requirement that the students must be unaccompanied. Currently, the waiver law excludes youth who are experiencing homelessness while accompanied by a parent. But these youth face the same difficulties in accessing higher education as youth who are homeless without a parent. And again, we were the first to do this in 2014. It made sense to be really cautious, and but now we're finding, again, that this is putting us out of step again with the rest of the nation and also out of step uh, with the needs of our, our young people. It's notable that foster youth continue to be eligible for Maryland's parallel foster youth tuition waiver, even if they are reunified with a family or have been adopted. So this change would, would address, address that disparity. So youth who are homeless should also be eligible for the tuition waiver. I'd also like to note that if we remove this exclusion, it will not result in an overwhelming increase in youth who receive the waiver. As the fiscal note indicates, only 720 students experiencing homelessness graduated from high school in Maryland during the last year for which the data is available. Um, and we know that there are an excess of 2000 students 
uh, that are experiencing homelessness in any uh, given year. And again, those are the ones that we're able to track. So this bill is targeted to those few youth who have overcome extreme odds. Remember, they must be accepted to college uh, in order to use the waiver. Uh, SB 155 would also require that institutions provide an application and an appeals process. Currently, we rely on the staff at institutions to interpret the tuition law, waiver law, to proactively identify eligible youth for the waiver. And as a consequence, the tuition exemption has been underutilized. So if we create a formal and standardized appeal process, we can create a mechanism by which that will ensure students receive assistance for which they are eligible. And then also uh, SB 155 directly addresses housing stability by requiring institutions that provide on-campus housing to give housing priority to waiver recipients. Four-year institutions frequently do not have enough housing for all students, and I understand this. Um, giving priorities to waiver recipients promotes housing stability without costing institutions anything. Also, this applies to institutions that provide on-campus housing, so it does not apply to two-year institutions. Uh, SB 155 clarifies also that tuition includes charges for every term, fall, winter, spring, and summer. This change codifies our original intent to provide students with full year-round support. This is simply a clarification and does not change current law. Uh, likewise, the bill allows students to keep the waiver when transferring to other institution. This protects transferring students against bureaucratic delays that can prevent them from receiving the waiver in time to register for classes. Uh, this has happened uh, multiple times over the years. Um, SB 155 also wants to provide greater transparency. It's very important that when we're making these types of investments and we're providing this type of support for our young people, that we'd be able to track it. So we require the institutions and MHEC to report the number of students requested, the number that are being given, and also the number that are denied, and to provide copies of forms used, including the waiver. Uh, also, we need to have copies of the application process and the appeal forms. And this allows us to troubleshoot any additional issues in implementing this law. Now, there are some sponsor amendments, because as you could tell by my explanations, it's slightly com complicated. And so we wanted to make sure that we get it right. So the first amendment prepares, uh, pertains to verification of homeless status for waiver eligible purposes. It specifies that a youth must have been verified as homeless during the 24 month period prior to the application for the waiver and list the ent entities that can provide that verification. We believe that this will help uh, institutions. It's going to add a, an existing list of homeless service providers and receive, who receive state funding and federally mandated TRIO programs. Uh, this is bringing into some other legislation that we've passed over the last couple of years around supporting um, uh, unaccompanied homeless youth and allowing these providers uh, to be aware, a way of verifying uh, that information. Um, this is a technical fix and it conforms to Maryland laws and others in Maryland law and to laws in other states. So it conforms us to other states and also it conforms us to uh, the, the current FAFSA. The second amendment creates a liaison within the financial aid office and other uh, appropriate offices. The liaison is going to support our students navigating through this waiver process. And remember, they, they may, uh, they often don't have uh, parents that have experienced co college and certainly don't have the, the time to, to, to support them uh, in moving through this process, or if they are the uh, homeless themselves, uh, not having a context in which they could provide the support. Um, many other states already require a li liaison or a single point of contact for homeless students on college campuses, and some campuses already have this, this, this person. And finally, I'm offering an amendment that requires this data reported by the institution in MHEC to be disaggregated uh, by demographic classifications. Uh, analyzing student demographics is really crucial to monitoring whether the waiver is truly an equalizing and providing equitable access uh, by supporting uh, a full range of youth, youth of color, trans, intersex, LGBTQ, uh, or questioning youth, uh, and a number of economic and regional differences that would really be important to the success of this bill. If schools don't already collect this information, they can easily do so on the required application. Just to address the uh, fiscal impact 
Uh, each of these changes are key to bringing about the, the promise of higher education, expanding access, which is a value of, this, of, our, of, our, of our legislature, uh, and it will not add unmanageable costs for the universities. If you check uh, the chart in the packet that I've provided, it really shows that the number of homeless youth granted each year is very small. Uh, and it does tell you the associated costs, but you can see the amount of aid given per student is really modest. It represents only tuition and mandatory fees, not room and board or other costs. Those are still going to have to be managed somehow by the student or other aid. You may also note that the number of waiver recipients has increased incrementally, very small uh, each year. Uh, so there's not going to be this wave of, of people uh, uh, taking a benefit. Uh, as we do a better job of ending homelessness in the state of Maryland, this won't be needed. But until we do that, uh, we need to provide these young people who, who are working so hard to achieve their higher education. Um, a majority of youth experiencing homelessness are not able to enroll in college for various reasons. So again, the number is going to be low. Uh, second, institutions are capable of adjusting enrollment mix to accommodate youth with tuition waivers. Uh, the University System of Maryland spends up to $17 million a year on tuition readmission for employees and their dependents. Uh, in contrast, it spent approximately half a million on homeless youth. So we're spending $17 million on one hand, people who have access, who are employed, and in contrast, we're only spending about a half a million for youth who are uh, the among our most vulnerable. Uh, so this, you know, any increase uh, in the latter uh, is, is nowhere near, is getting us incrementally towards equity and providing for these young people. Um, the fact that there's an increase is something we should celebrate. So supporting these young people, achieving college, we're really, as we know, will save the state money in the long run as they will become part of our, our economy. They'll, they'll be able to pay rent, they'll be able to get jobs, and then their children uh, will not be in the same situation that they were in. So again, in closing, this bill removes barriers for some of our most vulnerable and dedicated and talented students. Um, we can imagine a world in which housing status of a young person does not uh, make them ineligible to attend college. These students will, of course, be our thought leaders, our doctors, our inventors, our entrepreneurs. We know, we know already that they have to be in, incredibly motivated to even uh, to go over these, these odds and then to still uh, be accepted to college and university. So I would like to point out that there is no unfavorable testimony. Um, well, there's you know, a concern. Um, I'd like to thank you um, uh, and I ask for your favorable report with amendments. And um, uh, Chairman, you did uh, announce the speakers in the order that uh, we'd love for the committee to hear, and that would be Brian Watkins, uh, Dejanay Day, and Ingrid Lofman. And again, thank, thank you, you for your time. Okay, let's go to Brian Watkins as lead witness, Mr. Watkins. Chairman Pinsky and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today and give my testimony in support of Senate Bill 155. My name is Brian Watkins and I'm here today in my capacity as the founder and chair of the Fostering Terp Success Program at the University of Maryland College Park. Uh, the, the views I express are my own and not necessarily those of the university. We created the Foster and Terp Success Program two years ago to provide support to and eliminate barriers for students who have experienced foster care, are homeless or at risk of homelessness, and those who have no network of family support. I work closely with each of these students and understand the challenges they face. I also know their amazing strength and resilience in the midst of immense trauma. While the state of Maryland should take great pride in the fact that we have tuition waivers for foster care and unaccompanied homeless youth, the legislation also has created what I believe to be unintended negative consequences and results in inequities for those who need it most. I wanna provide two examples. The first example is about a student who is in his sophomore year at UMD. Throughout high school, he and his mother lived in their car in Anne Arundel County. Mom didn't work, so he worked part-time at an ice cream shop. When he saved up enough money, he rented a hotel room for the night so they could shower and sleep in a bed. When he came to the university, he had nothing. We provided him with bedding, clothing, a laptop, books and academic supplies, and we worked to get him eligible for the tuition waiver. This seemed like a no-brainer. However, he was determined to be ineligible. Since he is considered a dependent, he does not meet the definition of unaccompanied. While the spirit of the current legislation is to help youth experiencing homelessness, the requirement that someone be unaccompanied is a barrier. 
SB 155 will remedy this issue. My second example is from just this week. The student transferred to the University of Prince George's Community College and fall 2020 was his first semester at the University of Maryland. After his mom died tragically when he was 16 years old, he lived out of a car during high school, as well as in transitional housing here in Prince George's County. He qualified for the waiver at Prince George's Community College, but he's having trouble qualifying for the waiver at UMD. This speaks to the lack of consistency from institution to institution. Due to several delays processing forms and acquiring the proof needed for eligibility, the student has $5,000 in unpaid tuition for last semester, an unpaid balance that resulted in a financial block preventing him from registering for spring semester. I got the block removed from his account on Monday, so he was finally able to register. With changes to the legislation reflected in SB 155, when a student is determined eligible for the waiver by one institution, the student retains that eligibility at any other public institution in which the student enrolls. This is so important. My intent in sharing these stories is not to demean or diminish the important work of our financial aid administrators. They are my colleagues and friends and they are doing their jobs. They're following policies and protocols. They are following the legislation. Unfortunately, those things do not always place students in the center. Instead, these policies prioritize paperwork, check boxes, and restrictive terms and criteria over the traumas and truths of students. To our students, the perception is that our institutions are looking for a way out rather than a way in. Homelessness is homelessness. Accompanied by definition or not, there is shared trauma and experience of poverty. Home homelessness is not their only challenge. We also cannot ignore the fact that the youth most impacted by foster care and homelessness are disproportionately black, indigenous and people of color, as well as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and queer. We also know that the degree completion rate for foster care youth is significantly lower than that of all other students. Only 2% of those who enter higher education earn a degree. And the data for homeless youth is elusive. The national data does not yet exist. In addition to providing tuition support, this bill also ensures that each institution have a liaison, like me, who can help connect students to critical resources. The bill also establishes an application and appeal process, which will help standardize the eligibility process across institutions, create consistency, and reduce the confusion experienced by students. An application is not a burden to an institution, it's what we know how to do. That a student who is homeless makes it this far should be celebrated and we should do all we can to ensure their success. I ask you today to please support SB 155 and provide even better legislation that opens the doors for youth experiencing homelessness, reduces the immense burden of debt and provides a fighting chance to escape poverty. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Watkins, for your helpful testimony. Next is Dejanae De Day, please, from the Prince George's County Youth Action Board. Good morning, Senator Penske, Senator Washington, and the representatives of the committee. My name is Dejanae Day, Day, and I am in support of Senate Bill 155. I have had personal experience with using the tuition waiver bill when I was in college at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. I struggled to receive the waiver the first year I was homeless due to the application process, excuse me, process. I kept trying to receive the waiver for my whole sophomore year. And with help from my mentors and the support from the shelter I was staying at um, during my breaks, I was able to receive the um, waiver my junior year. But there are some youth that are not so lucky to have the support that I had. If there was a liaison, um, at the, for situations like this and at the, at the institution, excuse me, then I would have probably had a better understanding of the waiver and it would have not taken me a whole school year to get the waiver. During this time of a pandemic where some schools are fully virtual, it is hard for a youth who is going through homelessness to receive stable housing while trying to, find, uh, while trying to skin, attend school, excuse me, virtually. This bill will allow homeless youth the option to attend school, prevent youth from searching for alternative ways to survive and break the stigma of how homeless youth are viewed currently. For example, homeless youth are looked at sometimes as being lazy, not wanting to work or not wanting to pursue any form of education. My story has a bittersweet ending because I made it through the trials and tribulations to get my degree, but my other peers were not able to 
able to get the tuition waiver due to the challenges of getting the waiver, not knowing about the waiver or the mental strain of it all. My story also has a new beginning. I am a mother of one. I graduated on time thanks to the tuition waiver and the proper guidance. And now I am a co-chair, a youth advocate, and a youth advocate, excuse me, of a program called the Youth Action Board in Prince George's County that advocates for any youth homelessness. There can be more people like myself who can take their education to the next level with the support from the waiver. And overall, the tuition waiver bill will bring an increased awareness to the topic of homeless youth and young adults in the state of Maryland and nationwide. To end this off, education is the building block that can ensure the success of a youth. The bill will add a liaison for support applying for the waiver and make the application process clear and less of a burden for potential students. The youth will be, will be able to focus on other areas of life, such as mental health, employment, and recreation activities. Please make sure students struggling with housing instability during and after COVID-19 can access education. Again, mm -hmm. I encourage you to support Senate Bill 155, and I thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Dejanay. What a pretty name. Thank you for being here. <laughs> thank you. Uh, the last proponent witness is Ingrid Lofgren. Thank you, Ms. Lofgren. Homeless Persons Representation Project. Thank you, Vice Chair Kagan, members of the committee. My name is Ingrid Lofgren. I'm director of the Homeless Youth Initiative at Homeless Persons Representation Project. And in that capacity, I provide free legal support to youth and young adults under the age of 25 experiencing homelessness. I'm really proud to have worked on the bill that established the tuition waiver back in 2014 with Senator uh, Washington and Senator Riley. Um, and I'm, I'm just so grateful for the continued support of this waiver and the interest in wanting to make sure that it fulfills its promise to Maryland's talented students. Um, my colleagues have done a wonderful job uh, explaining to you what this bill does and why it's so important and I won't repeat them. I do just want to emphasize um, what we all know about the return on investment in education for talented youth. Um, the governor's two-generation family economic security commission found that post-secondary education is one of the very most effective ways to break intergenerational poverty. Um, we know that by nearly every measure, college graduates outperform peers with only a high school diploma. The average college graduate is 24% more likely to be employed and average earnings uh, among college graduates are about $32,000 higher annually and up to a million dollars over a lifetime uh, more. College graduates are three and a half times less likely to be living in poverty and nearly five times less likely to be incarcerated. Um, in all, lifetime expenditures are about $82,000 lower for college graduates, um, government expenditures than for those with a high school degree. I think you know, given what we've heard, Given what we know about um, the benefits to the state of investing in education, there really is not a downside to uh, making these changes and providing greater access to the tuition waiver for youth experiencing homelessness. Um, yeah. We actually have no opposition testimony. The testimony that was unfavorable was filed in error. It actually pertains to House Bill 155. Um, to <laughs> Just wanted to uh, to flag that for you. Thank uh, you. And again, thank you. I, I urge a favorable report on Senate Bill 155. Thank you very much, Ms. Lofgren. I was just going to flag there is a significant amount of written testimony. Uh, most of it is favorable, but you may want to take a look. Some have uh, suggested amendments. And I was going to mention that there's one unfavorable. So assuming that Mr. Yeah. Shedwin uh, filed that in error for a House bill, that's helpful yeah. information. Uh, I see Senator Riley has his hand up. Senator Riley, you have a question? Yes, I do. Uh, thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Um, this is an important bill. How we treat the most vulnerable is an indication of our heart and our treasure. Um, very happy to help sponsor it uh, several years ago. Mike, well, I'm a guy who likes data. If anybody has listened over the past few weeks, I keep asking about the budget and money and things of this nature. But in this particular uh, bill, uh, Senator Washington, uh, when we established it, we had no clue on the number of students who might take advantage of it. Uh, I appreciate Brian Watkins' comment about the foster care, only a 2% uh, 
we'd like to probably have that same type of an analysis for our homeless youth. My question to you for the benefit of the, um, of the committee is, how many children took advantage of it at the last measurable time frame? And do we have any statistics on graduation rates? Graduation, as uh, Ingrid had mentioned, is important, but every semester of college matters. Even if they don't finish to the end line, every semester matters. And so if we have a lot of kids, a sufficient number of children, adults, young adults in school, that's good. I'm also interested in seeing if we can develop those graduation. How many uh, students are uh, taking advantage of this at the last measurable time? Uh, Senator Washington, do you have those figures for our committee? Yes, and um, I believe it's in the packet and I can share it with you. I'm having trouble pulling it up, but if one of the committee member, maybe Ingrid has it, but um, we do have that. Uh, I thought I had it pulled up. So is it the Senator bottom Washington? of your attachment? Oh. We can just make sure that the committee has it prior. Yeah, can I make sure you have it for you? Sorry about that. That would be great. Thank you, Senator Riley, for your thoughtful question. Seeing any, seeing no other questions, other senators with questions? I want to thank the witness. Thank you, Senator Washington, for this bill that completes the hearing on Senate Bill 155. Next on the agenda is Senate Bill 209. Is Senator Peters with us? Senator He's Peters, here. welcome back to EHE. Good to have you here. Thank you very much, Madam Vice Chair. Um, for me, this is new territory. I uh, was honored to be put on the board of the ARC of Maryland. So I have uh, been putting in bills here to help young people with special ed issues. So um, my cross file is Delegate Guyton and she is an expert in this area. So um, we will be amending the bill, but I just wanna give you a an idea of the overall bill, and then um, we can talk later about it um, offline. So I appreciate your time. Um, this is an emergency bill, and it requires a local school board to offer and provide a special uh, specified special ed student whose school is subject to prolonged school closure, the option to continue attending school or receiving education services after the student's anticipated graduation date, regardless of whether the student has completed all high school graduation requirements. Obviously COVID has had a, a huge effect on our young people, particularly our special ed students. So that's the bill. Uh, the bill has a very high fiscal note, which I am going to drill into and uh, see what what's exactly is uh, uh, here because the advocates think it's, it's uh, unsure why it's so high. But that's it, Madam Vice Chair, and I'll, if I can, turn it over to the panel. Thank you very much, Senator Peters. It appears that your lead uh, leadoff witness is Lisa, uh, oh, is Ande Cole? Yes, yeah, she's, she's the Executive Director of the Bank okay. of Maryland. Followed by Lisa Widerlight and Dan Brathwaite. So, uh, okay. Andy Culp, welcome. You have five minutes, please. Great. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair Kagan and members of the committee. Um, I'm Andy Culp. And I'm the executive director of the ARC Maryland, as the Senator said. And um, as he also said, the Senate Bill 209 would provide transitioning students between the ages of 17 and 21 with the option to continue attending school or receiving education services after the student's previously anticipated exit date. And it would also require a county board to provide a notice to the parents or guardians of eligible students and their option to continue attending school or receiving certain education services. Um, I'm, I'm guessing most of you know, but just in case, um, a, a primer on transition planning, it's a process that's mandated by the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act of 2004 for all students who have an individualized education program in K through 12 education. And a transition in Maryland starts at age 14. It must be individualized for each student's needs and based on their skills, preference, and interest, and include opportunities to develop functional skills for work and community life. Um, so a lot of students with disabilities graduate from high school with a diploma at age 18 with the, school, with the skills that they need to move on successfully from there, but other children need more services than the general education curriculum offers, especially as they transition into adulthood. Um, they might need life um, skills like learning to balance a checkbook, 
crossing the street, preparing a meal, building uh, soft and, and concrete skills for employment and to be successful in the work world. Um, so these transition years for students with disabilities are critical time for knowledge building and achieving these um, orientation and mobility goals and developing these skills. Um, and and it, it, you know, the quality of the supports they get during this time are key indicators to their success um, as adults. Um, without the necessary transition components to their education programs, they're more likely to rely on more extensive and expensive supports into their adult services life upon school exit. Um, and during this time, this is, you know, we have excellent partnerships with the schools. Um, there have been considerable efforts made by our schools and teaching staff in, very, in many cases to try to modify the instruction and experiences for the student, you know, opportunities to virtually experience jobs and practice mobility, reading, and react to street signs, et cetera. Um, but, but that hasn't met the needs of a lot of students who really required that in-person support so that these goals couldn't be accomplished and they're not ready to go. Since student, if students are forced to graduate according to the previously determined timeline, despite these lost educational components, there will undoubtedly be a gap in knowledge and skills. Um, and we're talking about roughly 600 exiting students per year out of over 850,000 students in the system. So this is less than one tenth of a percent of all students in the system. Um, and, and we know that of the students that exited last June, so right after the pandemic hit, that only maybe less than half of them have connected with adult service providers for support. So there's this cliff that they've dropped off and we're trying to prevent more of that from happening in our state. Um, you know, we understand a lot of that delay in connecting with adult providers has to do with adult service provider capacity concerns, you know, funding, the staffing crisis that's exacerbated by uh, our pandemic. And so, you know, in closing, I wanted to say that, you know, we, we are hearing this great need from parents across the state, um, and we're hopeful for this solution that we think is going to benefit um, us all in the long run and ensure exiting TYs are best prepared to be active, successful, and contributing members of the community when they leave school. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Cole. Appreciate your testimony. Lisa Widerlight, you have two and a half minutes. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be able to present my oral testimony in support of um, Senate Bill 209 with amendments. I'm here to request that you extend appropriate school services to special education students over the age of 17 who have missed valuable time for transition to adulthood training during an extended school closure, such as the pandemic we're in now. Please ensure students with special needs who are set to graduate this year will benefit from this legislation. I'm a single mom who works multiple jobs and my son is a special education student with a comprehensive IEP due to his autism, epilepsy and other disabilities. He has a one-on-one -on -one aid when school's in person since he has trouble learning independently. My son is set to graduate high school in just four months with a certificate. From the time he was five until age 16, he attended a non-public special education school. Since then, he and the Baltimore County Public School team have worked successfully to transition him from the most residential, most restrictive non-residential high school to attending classes outside of general education and working at a farm with multiple tasks and responsibilities with his aide. Before March 2020, we were talking with that community work experience to increase his work hours and with another potential community work experience the other part of the day. Since March 2020, my son has sat at home in front of a computer, watching videos about different jobs he can consider, listening to a teacher talk about the importance of being respectful and dressing appropriately for a job, and writing a resume. This is not what the IEP team decided he needs. His IEP and needs assessment show that he should be out in the community learning how to do specific job skills. Before school closed almost a year ago, my son was in the community learning from his mentors at the farm. He has most likely lost the majority of his skills that he was using at the farm, and he will not have the ability with an adult service provider in June to have more job training because that is not their responsibility. This is a travesty. 
Research shows that up to 80% of people with autism are unemployed or underemployed. And my son has shown he can work. He wants to work. He tells me consistently that he misses the farm and asked to go there to visit just last week. Please give him a chance to have employment prospects by providing him with the extended time for school transition services he needs and deserves. It wasn't his fault the pandemic happened and he should not be penalized for it by losing his final year in school. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Ms. Wider Light, and good luck with your son. Thank you. Next witness is Andrew Stetner from the Howard County Autism Society. Mr. Stetner. Hi, good, good afternoon. This is Andrew Stetner. I am a parent of an autistic child and a member of the board of directors of the Howard County Autism Society. And I'm pleased to submit this testimony in favor, in favor with amendments of SB 209. Uh, we've also experienced firsthand how difficult it's been to provide a free and appropriate public education during the pandemic. Our daughter, like so many other special education students with autism, relies on one-on-one -on -one supports like hand-over-hand -hand prompting, facial cues, and physical materials. Even in the best efforts, these cannot be replicated in the virtual environment. It's a very common concern expressed by the members of the Autism Society. While our child is young, the issue has additional difficulty dimensions for older children. Managing and distant youth were scheduled to embark on vocational education and job training. The pandemic has forced many of these activities to be altered or canceled, making students less prepared for the transition to adulthood. There is no doubt that the counties were gonna, will deliver comp compensatory services to make up to ma for major ground loss during the pandemic. But the pandemic and the service interruption has gone on too long to reasonably expect the counties to be able to catch up by the time for those students who are over the age of 17 to get those services by the time they complete school at 21. The most straightforward solution is to give students more time to receive services, continue their studies, and prepare for an independent adult life in collaboration with the Developmental Disabilities Administration and the Department of Rehabilitation Services. I also support amending Section L of this bill, which would reduce the amount of compensatory services awarded to students if they choose to extend their education. We need both those compensatory services to catch up to what is lost and that additional time to get the work experience and the other services are needed. And like Andy said, I know this, um, this is a cost to the counties uh, and to the state, but there's a cost on the other side that may be difficult to calculate. If our transitioning youth do not complete school with the kind of uh, vocational skills and connection, that's gonna cost uh, more to the taxpayers uh, and to the state um, and additional services that will need to be provided. So I was just thrilled uh, to see this bill uh, introduced. Thanks so much for our Senate sponsor. I really hope it is something that we'll be able to get done uh, in time for those who are transitioning this year and in the co coming years. Thank you, Mr. Thank you so much for your time. We're wrapping up the proponents. Uh, Deanna Brathway, thank you for being with us. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and Mrs. Vice Chair. I am... Um, I am, my name is Deanna um, Brathwaite and I'm here to support of the um, Senate Bill 209 to ensure that students who are transitioning youth gain extra time in school to support their skills needed for employment in the adult service world. Since we have gone virtual March, 2020, my student has not received or worked on skills to enter college employment or to be self-supporting, uh, be a self-supporting working citizen. I am here today representing my student who is a senior with an IEP in the Howard County Public School System. Since entering into the Howard County Public School System in 2014, he has struggled to read and comprehend as a disability of dyslexia and or need for appropriate reading intervention which has not been granted by the Howard County Public School System. Testing and evaluation were not monitored or administered accordingly by the appropriate IEP team, identifying the exact disability. He has suffered bullying by teachers, whereas numerous complaints have been filed with the school board he has not and is not receiving a um, FAPE, but yet he is slated to exit in May. He currently is reading on the ninth grade level and proper interventions have not been given during the school closure. He needs these skills to work 
or to enter into college or as being a self-supporting working citizen. School closure has called him to fall further behind having school refusal behaviors, depression, and lack of contact from school teachers and administration has not helped. I have obtained an attorney to help with compensatory services and a true diagnosis to help my student with being successful. These funds for the attorney are provided by the Disabilities Rights of Maryland. But to be honest, I shouldn't have to um, inquire or need this bill for my student to get the services needed, meeting the goals and his objectives on his IEP. We need this bill to be passed as my student has suffered enough without an education. During this last year and previous years without a good foundation of reading, writing, comprehending and technical skills. He would need at least an extra 10 months in school to gain these reading and educational skills going forward to obtain a job or to enter into college. I wanna thank the committee for the opportunity, hearing my concerns and ask to vote favorably for the Senate Bill 209 to ensure that my student and others get the skills they need right now. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Ms. Brathwaite. And I guess we caught a glimpse for a moment of, uh, of young Whiter Light, so who was showing up as an advocate. So thank you for that. We do have two uh, opponents to this bill, uh, the Maryland Association of Counties, who, which has submitted written testimony, and then uh, John, uh, John Woolham's Maryland Association of Boards of Education, who is testifying in uh, orally as well. Mr. Willems, thank you for being with us. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. John Willems representing the Maryland Association of Boards of Education. Uh, of course, uh, my ears pricked up immediately when uh, the sponsor, Senator Peters, referred to uh, sponsor amendments. Uh, and I, I believe that I could discern from the testimony that we are talking about a much smaller a set of students than is reflected in the initial draft of the bill and the fiscal note. Mabe's written testimony certainly highlights our concern with uh, the bill's kind of broadest possible definition of eligible student, any student um, receiving special education services uh, with a disability. Uh, and, and so that clearly impacts uh, the testimony and the fiscal note relative to the scope and scale of the uh, mandates uh, in the bill relative to the parent option to secure an, a full extra year of special education instruction uh, under the bill. And so you have my written testimony. Um, we're clearly um, uh, opposed to the, to the uniform and rather mammoth mandate presented by the bill as drafted, uh, but we are always uh, on behalf of the local boards in Maryland uh, willing to sit at the table and work through uh, special education related bills as we have in the past related to parental consent uh, around decisions uh, affecting their students uh, placement and services and uh, a number of other uh, number of other issues uh, over the years that as we often point out uh, ensure that Maryland provides a higher standard of special education services to students uh, than is required by the federal law and we tend to be at the vanguard, whether we're talking about uh, corollary athletics uh, or parental consent uh, provisions uh, relative to other states in the country. So we look forward to working with the sponsor and the committee uh, on this legislation. But again, our, our testimony uh, for better or worse is in strong opposition to the bill as drafted. Uh, and, um, and at this point, uh, not having seen the amendments would continue to support an unfavorable report uh, on the bill, uh, but 600 students or something smaller, um, we we look forward to working with the proponents of this legislation. Thank you, Mr. Willems. And after you and Senator Peters, the sponsor of the bill, uh, are able to swap ideas and work on amendments, please make sure you circle back and let us know if your position changes as a result of Senator Peters' amendments that we may see. Uh, with that, uh, Senator Ellis has a question. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Um, thank you, uh, Senator Peters, for this bill. And all my colleagues, all these bills uh, I'm listening to uh, intently, uh, 
this morning, these bills just attack problems that's happening now in our state and offer solutions. So I look forward to uh, see how we can work together and make it happen. I have a kind of a technical question. Um, I know witness Ms. Brathwaite, I believe, she testified, so I'm listening closely. And um, if she's still here, she used a term when her son, she used, uh, he doesn't have a FAPE, F-A-P-E. I'm not familiar, I'm not sure if I heard that or understand that term. I just want to say, as you come on, Ms. Brathwaite, you explain that to me, but I really appreciate your advocacy. You're leading out for your son. Your son is so fortunate to have you as a mom. So thank you for your standing up for him, fighting for him. And if you could just uh, explain uh, my misunderstanding of that acronym. I can't hear you, ma'am, you're muted. That is um, under the legislation, I guess the code of what they switched to with the school closure. So, um, I didn't really get into it in depth, but that's what they, instead of having the IEP regimented to being in the building, this is what they resulted to with um, going to the home, being okay. virtual. So you use the term, did I get it right? FAP, FAPE? Yes. Okay. Um, I don't want to put you a spot. I mean, does anyone want to know what that, that is? Or I know we use acronyms. I got to go back and remember because being yeah. acronyms, I'm not too. Okay. I, I, I understand. I, We're all in the same situation. Somebody on um, the line might understand. Lisa. Uh, Ms. Lisa uh, FAPE stands for Free and Appropriate Public Education. It is a right to special education students guaranteed by the federal IDEA individuals and educational. Okay. It's, it's a federal right granted to education students, free and appropriate okay. public education. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> sure. Okay. Thought I'd put you on the spot. Mr. That's Brown. okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Senator Ellis and I are both on the anti-acronym uh, parade here. So thank you, Senator Ellis. Uh, I see no other senators with questions. That is the case. So that concludes the hearing on Senate Bill 209. I just want to- Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. That it's 1213 and we need to wrap up by 1230. Uh, the committee does have a voting session and then more hearings. So we're going to try to watch the clock a little bit. Um, so Senator Hester, why don't you give us Senate Bill 126? And uh, to the degree that your colleagues are able to be succinct, we would be grateful. I see no opposition testimony whatsoever. So I think we can do some versions of Me Too and all that to be concise. Senator Hester, welcome with Senate Bill 126. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. I'll be as quick as possible. Um, distinguished members of the Education, Health and Environment Affairs Committee, thank you for your consideration of Senate Bill 126. Over the last several months, each and every one of us has heard from our constituents about the challenges that our students are facing with the virtual environment. And this is especially true of our students with early literacy challenges and dyslexia, for whom the impacts of this loss of this instructional time only compound the pre-existing challenges they faced. Now, Senate Bill 126 aims to address these challenges. Um, it was a, and it was a recommendation of the Maryland Dyslexia Task Force from 2015. And it follows a model laid out by 23 other states, including Texas, California, and New Jersey, to bring together a diverse group of stakeholders to create a comprehensive resource on reading and dyslexia. The Reading and Dyslexia Handbook um, it, sorry, the bill creates the stakeholder advisory group to collaborate on the creation of the reading and dyslexia handbook as a central repository of tools. The handbook would include, first of all, evidence-based practices for reading screening, identification of reading difficulties, comprehensive literacy instruction, and other specifically designed instructions and interventions. Second, definitions, indicators, and characteristics of reading difficulties, dyslexia, and dysgraphia. Third, recommendations for student accommodations, including assistive technology and methods of parent engagement and uh, communication. And finally, it requires MSDE to designate one dyslexia liaison to assist local school systems in implementing professional development opportunities and other forms of technical assistance based on the, on the reading and dyslexia handbook. I'd like to point out that uh, there is a long uh, list of over 100 pieces of favorable testimony from across the state and from organizations as diverse as the Education Advocacy Coalition, the Education, um, the Maryland Education Coalition, 
the National Association of Pediatric Nurse Practitioners, the Maryland Psychologist Association, NAACP, and the Baltimore Jewish Council. This bill will make sure that the best practices reach the hands of our parents and teachers to identify children with reading difficulties earlier in their life and to implement more effective interventions following that identification. For those reasons, I respectfully request a favorable report on Senate Bill 126. Thank you, Senator Hester. And it looks like um, Stephanie Carr is your lead proponent, kickoff witness. I just wanna confirm that, followed by um, Alex Murphy and David Murray. Is that, that correct? Is correct? Okay, and then William Fluke will wrap us up. Okay, Stephanie Carr. Good afternoon, members of the committee. My name is Stephanie Carr and I'm a former high school general education teacher, current co-chair of the Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee for Howard County, and one of the five founding members of Decoding Dyslexia Howard County chapter. And most importantly, a parent of three children with disabilities who all share dyslexia. I am testifying in support of Senate Bill 126, which would result in the creation of a reading and dyslexia handbook that would provide much needed guidance to the local school districts, on further changing the long-term practices of reading and literacy instruction that have not provided all children with the basic ability to read. As a former high school general education teacher from Baltimore City and Anne Arundel County, I experienced firsthand the damage that inappropriate core instruction at the elementary level inflicts, how the lack of evidence-based interventions was unable to remediate the skills students did not have, and the inability for students to comprehend curriculum required to graduate. By the time a student enters ninth grade, the gap between a student's grade level and their academic ability had grown so wide that the focus is not on the long-term effects of the inability to read proficiently, but on passing standardized tests and graduating on time. Fortunately, protocols to combat these practices will be outlined with the passage of the Reading and Dyslexia Handbook Bill. The Maryland State Department of Education will be providing local districts guidelines to support evidence-based interventions for students through 12th grade. Local school districts will be responsible for providing appropriate core instruction and a system of reading supports from pre-kindergarten through high school, which enables students to receive help in the appropriate skill deficits regardless of their grade. The handbook will also be a resource for general educators on the definitions and characteristics of reading difficulties, dyslexia, and dysgraphia. Due to my experience in education, I have worked with a multiple, multitude of parents across three count Maryland counties since 2016. Every single child I have been involved with has struggled to read. Many of these students are identified with a specific learning disability in reading, along with the comorbid disabilities of dysgraphia and ADHD. While each student's IEP is different, one problem was obvious. The student, while making progress on their IEP goals, is not closing the achievement gap and unable to meet grade level standards. Each school has its own culture and the lack of specific guidelines regarding reading has caused inconsistency in identification, remediation, and what is considered best practices for reading instruction. The COVID-19 pandemic has created an environment that students who struggle academically will have regressed and suffered a loss of learning. Students with reading struggles and or disabilities along with other vulnerable populations are doubly impacted as they cannot receive the in-person teaching that is so critical to make progress and they are struggling to access the online instruction due to their circumstances. Many students do not have the ability to read the online presentation and follow multiple step processes necessary to learn in the current technological environment. As a parent of three children with dyslexia who have been identified at three different times in their educational career, I've watched my children suffer both academically and emotionally. The emotional toll of not being able to read as well as their peers was equally as devastating as the academic struggles. As many as 20% of children with dyslexia also suffer from depression and another 20% suffer from some form of anxiety disorder. Senate Bill 126 is a cost-effective way to bring Maryland schools into alignment with the research on how students learn to read. While the fiscal note does indicate that MSDE will need an additional position to support the liaison role, the bill clearly states that MSDE is able to appoint an existing member of staff to perform these duties along with current responsibilities. In July of 2020, Dr. Karen Salmon sent a letter to Delegate Ludke stating that our English language arts coordinator possesses many of the necessary skills and knowledge to provide these supports. An individual has already been identified who can fulfill this role. The bill makes no attempt to interfere with the local school district's ability to decide on specific interventions and instructional materials. Rather, it will provide a one-stop shop of resources for improving all students' outcome in reading. 
These resources, materials, and information laid out in the handbook will help guide administrators, educators, and parents on standards, instruction, and practices in and outside the classroom. There can be no doubt that this guidance is needed when approximately 55 to 60% of all Maryland children are not meeting grade level expectations on the MCAP English language arts exam across all tested areas. The handbook also supports the implementation of the Ready to Read Act and will guide school systems on collecting data from the screener and align supplemental reading instruction interventions to student needs. I want to thank the committee for the opportunity to speak, and I urge a favorable report from the Senate Education, Health, and Environmental Affairs Committee for the Senate to pass Senate Bill 126 to create the Reading and Dyslexia Handbook to support our local school systems in the endeavor of teaching reading to all children. Thank you, Ms. Carr. Thank you. Correct. Uh, something I said, I said there was no opposition and that was erroneous. I'm afraid it was not highlighted, but uh, John Woolham's is, uh, has submitted unfavorable testimony. We will hear from him. But first, I suspect we're going to hear from a superstar witness here with Alex Murphy. Go for it, Alex. We're so glad to have you in the Senate with us today. Okay, but we can't. Wait, wait, wait. You're going to have to put your testimony down so we can see your face, if that's okay. So if your helper person can just put that in front of you. And if you move really close to the to your computer so we can hear you really well. Please, uh we're eager to hear your thoughts. Hello, honorable members of the Maryland State Senate. My name is Alex Murphy and I am in fifth grade. I have dyslexia. I have a hard time with spelling, reading and writing. When I was in public school, I felt frustrated. There was one book that I couldn't read so I would just look at the pictures during reading time. It took me twice as long to take the standardized test than all the other students. Most students take it in one day and I took two days. My parents now have me in a private school for kids with dyslexia. My reading teacher at my current school teaches me how to decode words, practices spelling different words, and we practice reading sentences by playing games. In language, in language arts, my write we write paragraphs and we take a lot of time learning how to write a good paragraph using different colors for the different types of sentences in our paragraphs i think the reading and dyslexia handbook is a good idea because it's like a guide for teachers and parents to know what dyslexia is and how to teach kids with dyslexia when i was at my public school, they didn't really know about dyslexia. This handbook would be written by people who know a lot about dyslexia and reading. They can share what they know about how kids learn to read. The handbook can also explain how to teach kids to read. I think it's important that all kids would be taught to read. Not all kids will have a chance to go to a private school like me. Therefore, I think all kids should have the opportunity to learn the way their brains need to. Thank you for your time, consideration of supporting this bill. Thank you, Alex. You did a great job as I knew you would. Thank you and you read it beautifully. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, William Fluke is going to wrap up the proponents. Mr. Fluke. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Mr. Fluke. I'm sorry. I All right. You are David Murray. Is, I thought there was somebody before me. All right. Sorry, you're wrapping up. I apologize. Uh, Mr. Murray, welcome. Thank you so much. Good morning. I'm Chairman Pinsky, Vice Chairwoman Kagan. Thank you so much, Sean, for having me this morning. My name is David Murray. I serve as the school board member representing District 1 on the Prince George's County Board of Education. I am also a dedicated special education teacher and um, just hopped out of a session with one of my students um, where, you know, I'm working on the very things um, that I think are important for our dyslexic students and really all of our struggling readers in Maryland. Um, I won't go through and read this entire testimony that I had written out and just wanted to urge your, um, your serious consideration for this bill. Um, it's extremely critical that we lead from a statewide level on this. You know, there are things that um, obviously we need to let our teachers work out in the classroom. And then there are things that are so important that we have to make sure that every teacher does because it's just good teaching. 
Um, you know, we've heard a lot across the nation about following the science as it relates to COVID and we should. Now we need to follow the science of reading as it relates to how students um, learn to read. Um, and so in my experience in the classroom, you know, I have, um, I've really seen both sides of it. I came in and, and really didn't know, um, you know, the, the right way to teach students to read. And unfortunately, even with my best efforts, it wasn't going to be enough if I wasn't going about it the right way. Um, I'm really thankful to have run into a lot of the very advocates um, that you've heard from today. Um, and that's really helped inform my instruction and, and paying great dividends for, for my special needs students that I teach. And um, it's something I'm looking forward to champion in Prince George's County um, when our school system. And I'm so thankful that this bill has been introduced and would um, urge your favorable vote. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Murray, for testifying and for your service on the school board. It's important. Thank you. Mr. Fluke, now it's your turn. Please uh, please share your thoughts. Thank you, Vice Chair Kagan and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Dr. William Fluke. I'm speaking today on behalf of the Maryland Psychological Association in support of the bill before you. Um, I'm a licensed psychologist, a school psychologist. I have over 50 years of service in public education, including work in three Maryland public school systems and the, at the Maryland State Department of Education. As a psychologist, first and foremost, I can validate the comments made by others on the really adverse emotional impact that dyslexia has on students. Just to add, I, I'm not gonna go through all of my written testimony, you have a copy of it. Um, I will say that school systems in general are waking up and are trying harder. Uh, they're not necessarily doing it all consistently or effectively. Uh, this bill will produce uh, a guidance document at the state level to improve the quality and the consistency of our efforts in this area. Um, totally support this bill. Uh, our association um, has spoken with the proponents and the sponsors about a small amendment. Um, the, the bill original language calls for the work group to develop tools and materials for the identification of dyslexia. Uh, in fact, those tools already exist and developing them is really long and expensive process involving a lot of research. Our re request is that you change the word from develop to identify. Uh, there are good ones out there and um, I'm sure that the work group can find them. Thank you. Uh, certainly urge you uh, to support Senate Bill 126 and um, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fluke. And I'm sure Senator Hester will take that under advisement. Appreciate your testimony. I see no uh, questions. Uh, for the proponents, we are going to shift to one opponent if John Willems is still here. Mr. Willems, if he is not here, uh, yes, yeah, so uh, he has submitted written testimony and you all can find that uh, in your packets. So with that, uh, seeing no questions, that concludes the hearing on Senate Bill 126. Um, colleagues, we are going to adjourn for a moment for, for a little bit. We are coming back at 1.30 for voting, but we will continue our hearings uh, first. And so I just want to make sure that anyone listening, as well as those who, um, who are watching online or who have bills, I want to flag for you that Senator Ellis, Senate Bill 245, uh, Senator Bailey, Senate Bill 249, Senator Patterson, Senate Bill 266, Senator Peters, Senate Bill 300, and Senator Ellis, Senate Bill 308 will be heard beginning at 1.30 this afternoon, following by, followed by a voting session. Anything else? Okay. With that, uh, the committee will adjourn and thank you all. Alex, we're going to look for great things from you. So keep, keep doing your good school work and, and all that. Senator Hester.